welcome very much. <laughs> Um, I'm very happy that uh, Mr. William Ray Lung is in our midst. Uh, he single-handedly got rid of the invalidated uh, four provisions uh, that were in breach with the Bill of Rights Ordinance. Um, so today we are in a lecture uh, for uh, the principles of um, constitutional law and uh, we are in the public, in the public we have uh, our great students of the JE program of CUHK. So, um, the students of the two groups, the previous two groups, had uh, quite some interesting questions yeah. and I would like to ask you, one second. I hope there will be some interesting questions from you. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, first I give the opportunity uh, to you. So who has uh, questions? And I'll give you the... Uh, who has a question? Yeah? Can, can you uh, maybe say about that? Uh, can I ask you what makes you uh, interested in bringing this court, bringing this case to court? Is what? it uh, personal? What's your idea? So you were asking basically why I brought the case. Why I brought the case to court. Um, and so just before I start, I'd like to thank you for inviting me again, and I appreciate our patience speaking with you today. Um, I also understand sometimes, uh, for whatever reasons, uh, you might not want to raise a question orally uh, if you want to bring up. I mean, it doesn't seem like anybody used paper these days, so you can just look around at everybody's obsessed with Apple and an iPad, I mean, uh, a ThinkPad. Um, <laughs> but uh, if you want to put your questions on the paper, I will block them uh, that as well. You can just leave it there and we can collect that later. Um, but uh, why I brought the case, uh, I mean, I think uh, I have been obviously uh, aware of the difference in age of consent for some time. Um, and uh, that made it difficult to have anything, any lasting meaningful relationships because of the position given by the law. Now, um, it was also, I was lucky in that, like, you know, uh, my lawyer, Michael Bickler, was a good friend of mine that we got to know each other for a good friend. Um, so, like, you know, he was kind enough to, like, you know, uh, gave me the legal advice on what we could do and possibly bring a challenge against the government. And I think sort of that gave me the reason uh, to think about, like, you know, why do we, if I really want to push forward um, and uh, um, what does it entail? Because for me personally, um, challenging or launching a judicial review is one thing. Uh, we already anticipated, like, you know, if we were to go ahead with the case, there would be media interests and whatnot. I had been out to some friends, I hadn't been out there to my family yet, so uh, obviously the decision was not only to take up the case, to consider, like, you know, if I do proceed with the case, um, the, uh, what I had to also consider was, like, okay, like, you know, that gave me a timeline to come out to my family, so, and, and, and quite a very public manner as well. Uh, <laughs> in case, yeah, in case anybody remembered. Um, so, um, but I think that was important that uh, I, I, um, I think personally I felt very strongly about pushing forward the case um, because I was in a position where I, I sort of figured it out my family would be um, okay. <laughs> At least with accepting me, accepting that there would be a case to follow was a, a slightly different issue. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, um, I was very lucky with you know the position I was in with my family. I was very lucky with uh, having a, a good friend who is a lawyer who can represent me um, and giving me a lot of great advice with our charge. And so, like you know. Um, and I felt that I was in a position 
a very privileged position. Uh, I was at a, I was at a job um, where um, there w I was working for Doctors Without Borders at Maison Saint Fontier. So we had a very strong charter at work um, of non-discrimination, uh, regardless of many grounds. Uh, so that gave me the protection that I felt like you know that I need. I, I, I knew I wouldn't be fired from my job. That's for sure. Uh, that there's job security, um, and that was also very important. So like, you know that the, re the reason why, and I think that was the reason why I, I felt it was very important that I was able to do something, because um, um, you know who, who knows like you know when the government's going to take the initiative to change to make that change. I mean, indeed, even after the court case, I mean, it took until last year uh, for the law to be changed. So like you know, what, what, had there not been such initiative. You know, it's up, up to anybody's guess when that change will be, and so if I could be a part of that change, then I was very happy to be involved in that. Right. And what about the funding? Um, who uh, gave the funding? Because it's very, very costly situation, yeah. right? Yes. Um, well, uh, the funding, part of the funding came from, uh, like, you know, Michael was very kind to take up a lot. Michael being my solicitor was very kind to take up a lot of his work. Hitler. Mid 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 yeah, Mr. Hitler. Mr. Hitler. Mr. Hitler. Uh, he takes on a lot of human rights cases as well. You know, like you know, the W case um, regarding Christian marriage rights. Um, and um, QT, he represented Joshua Wall. He took on a lot of human rights cases as well. Like, you know, the HGT or like that or not. But, um, he took on a lot of pro bono work uh, until finally the uh, aid was granted. So, uh, you know, in terms of funding, um, I was just sort of like, you know, I just started working and I didn't have a lot of savings and if the UAE did a lot of easier for me. And, um, yeah. Right. So, any other question? Okay. Does the case uh, influence your life right now? I mean, personally, are you affected? Throughout the process of the hearings and afterwards, I, I mean, funding is not an issue, it seems. But in terms of time and your personal energy involved, why are you? Well, in terms of uh, so th th there was a question of like you know how does it affect me uh, personally in, in my life? Um, well, I think the the effect probably felt today in that I'm here speaking with you <laughs> still, 10 years later. Um, time, I mean like, I, I had a great legal team, Michael uh, was great in getting a lot of things sorted out for me, giving me the legal expertise that I didn't have and I do not have. Um, <laughs> but uh, personally it was just sort of like taking time to, um, well it was more interviews, attending interviews, <coughs> it's like two, uh, two or three occasions where I go to the court, and, you know. Um, but otherwise, I mean, how it affected me, I think it affected me in that, like, you know, I was able to, um, I sort of, in a way, became public face uh, to LGBT rights, to gay rights at the very least. Uh, and that um, had been a very interesting experience because, like, you know, um, not many people had um, the again, like you know, I talked about my privileged position and that, like you know, uh, I didn't have to worry about my job security. My family was sort of okay at the time; they were sort of okay. Like you know, now they're really okay now. Like you know, me being gay and really popular with them. Um, so, um, but in fact, me sort of like you know, I became a public face, so I kind of like you know, uh, started pushing things a little bit more into like you know, engaging with the government. Ways, engaging in dialogues in uh, different ways and trying to move things forward on other gay issues. Um, I became more bold, I got to talk about it a lot more often. I, I, it was interesting in that, like, you know, shortly after the case, because it was sort of like you know, a very public case, um, there are places that I go to you know, where I eat often, you know, the, 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 the owner who I see sort of like you know, once every I don't know, two months or whatnot, like, you know, they remember me. You know, these places you go back to, um, you never know their name, sort of, but like, you know, you just sort of have chit chats and they kind of like, you know, they mention about the case and, and it's really, really encouraging 
to hear the positive remarks. It's always been positive, like, you know, whenever I, I whenever people want to say something to me, it's, I'm very lucky also, but, you know, I have, I hadn't, I have not still until this day had anyone kind of come up to me and say anything negative to me, but, you know, uh, nasty or calling me names. So, so I'm very lucky, but at the same time, a lot of people experience that, I have to say, and I just add that. But for me, um, that made me also realize, like, you know, we can say, we, and we often do say, well, Hong Kong is very conservative, it's very traditional, uh, you know, homosexuality, such issues not really uh, accepted. Um, but I've, my experience has proved that wrong. Um, my experience has been that you know, people who I don't know often come up to me, uh, they even went to my mom at the time when people knew you know, me and can associate me from my mom, you know, they went to her and say, well, you know, they, they, they said very positive things, and that made me think, well, we are not as conservative and as narrow-minded we think we are sometimes, and I think on a personal level, on an interpersonal level, um, people might not be informed about what homosexuality means, or, like, you know, that there's a very side, um, portrayal of what homosexuality means that like, you know, they might not know any open, openly gay people. So uh, I, I, the experience for me has been that like, you know, it's been very positive and people are very accepting. Uh, they need to know more and me being that person, I can give them what they want to know and like, you know, uh, demystify it. Uh, so that has been the, the, the change, I think, like, you know, how it affects me and how I've become, you know, the, uh, Interpersonal change uh, and connections that I have with others. You became the vice chair of this organization, Pink Alliance, right? That's correct. Can you tell something about this organization? Uh, well, Pink Alliance is an organization uh, worked on LGBT rights, working on realizing LGBT rights. Um, and so through, uh, we co organized the Pink Dot uh, that happened a few weeks ago. Uh, there's the Pink Season, it was like a festive of LGBT cultural events. Um, we engage in dialogues with governments, with uh, electoral members. Uh, in fact, next week I'll be traveling to Geneva, uh, to the UN, to uh, some mix submissions to the Convention Against Torture on uh, a few of our issues of our concern, uh, the, the transgender, the, the recognition of, the gender recognition of transgender people requires surgeries, for example, in Hong Kong as a concern. Um, and not only Hong Kong level, but the UN level, so making submissions to the UN and all that, so, um, yeah. Before we make a review of these last 10 years, mm -hmm. because there's probably some trends and developments, hopefully, uh, positive ones, hopefully, um, can we, uh, can you take us back to the time when you were in court, um, and did you have discussions with the, maybe with the, uh, some of the, uh, Judges, they ask you questions. How did that go? Can you tell us some of this experience? I know it's a long time ago, but uh, what uh, was your experience at the time? Well, I didn't really have to interact with the judges. Um, they didn't talk to me directly or indirectly. Uh, I mean, it was just a, a matter of, like, you know, the, 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 the barrister was arguing their cases on both sides. It was interesting, however, to. Um, be in a courtroom. I mean, it was obviously my first time being in a courtroom, and um, and they were citing uh, uh, case laws and whatnot from sort of like you know, the Victorian era. So like you know, they're talking about like anal sex, and um, they're talking about like bestiality and all kinds yeah, of different see. reasons that like you know led to where we are or where we were in the court that I thought it was very interesting, like, you know, so, um, but that, so I, I thought that was sort of like, you know, a, an interesting experience, uh, an interesting, an also interesting experience was uh, my grandmother uh, was, uh, uh, well, she, she was super supportive, I mean, she'd be going to Pride tomorrow, yeah, anybody going to Pride tomorrow? What, nobody? Oh, there's one. Oh, oh, there you are, hi! <laughs> 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 uh, uh, so, well, um, 
Oh, I do hope to see you tomorrow at Pride, but I mean, like, you know, my, my, it's also for straight people, right? It's for everybody, and I think everybody should come. And I was actually, uh, before coming, I was writing, uh, I was asked to write an editorial that I hope to finish soon. Uh, but Pride should really be an occasion where, like, you know, people go not only the gays, but, like, you know, allies to show their support as well. Because uh, nothing gets done without the support of the allies. Um, Can you tell us something about uh, this time? Um, were you despairing sometimes, or uh, were you very positive that it would work out fine? Because it, you could also have lost the game, mm -hmm. and then you had to appeal. Yeah. But how, how did that go? Um, I think for me, um, being obviously 19 and 20 at the time, I was probably naive, but at the same time, I thought that was quite a strong case that I didn't think about losing. Uh, so <laughs> I was like, I don't think that's gonna happen. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm very uh, optimistic about that. So uh, and, and indeed, I mean, like, you know, for uh, optimistic aside, uh, being optimistic aside, I think it was a very strong case. I mean, how do you justify the difference? And indeed, there was no justification um, as shown. So yeah. So so I ask some questions from the uh, previous uh, groups. So. One of the questions in both groups, previous groups, was that um, why so late if you're 20? Because you could also have waited for one more year and then it would be also legal to uh, missing the point. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, you jeopardize your, your personal life, uh, so much energy goes in it, probably. Mm -hmm. um, what is your response to the question? Why did I wait? I don't think it was an active wait. And as I said, I, you know, um, I think it was just timing and you know, the universe lined up and um, that I was able to discuss this matter with a friend who is a lawyer who is interested in human rights cases. Um, I mean, well, I mean, I, again, like, you know, I didn't study law, but at the same time, I knew the law affects me, affected me, well, laws affects me, yes. Um, so, um, but there was very little I know what to do otherwise, like, you know, being, I mean, being well, but I think they were arguing, like, you know, from the time that it applies, so that, that were, therefore, I think, like, you know, from the moment from 16 onwards, and that should have launched the case, I mean, like, you know, well, unfortunately, like, you know, they didn't teach a lot of law and human rights and responsibility in the school enough that, like, you know, you know, you know, as a, for a 16-year-old to know to challenge the system. Um, they should, I mean, like, you know, if that was the case that they were making, they should probably make it into education so people know about these things, but they didn't, so I didn't know about that. But Question from the audience? What's the future direction of your organization? And um, your um, would be on judicial review or the legislation or on promoting community awareness or you will do all the things? Mm. Wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think we all heard the questions about what are we, what is our organization going to do? Um, we are a volunteer organization, so like you know, I'm the vice chair, but even then, I'm a, I'm a volunteer position. So we all have our daytime job, um, and uh, sometimes it gets a little bit difficult. Uh, I mean, obviously, we want to do all those things you said, um, but you know, time against resources. Um, <coughs> Uh, but right now what we're looking at is sort of like, you know, my part, my role is more sort of like engaging with the UN committees. So, um, you know, the international laws and conventions and treaties that are applicable to Hong Kong. It's the topic of today. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do I have to talk about that? Oh, we discussed already. Uh, you know, we make submissions to the UN, so, you know, I participate as a civil society and I basically say, well, the government says this about how they're fulfilling their obligations, while on the other hand, I said, well, not quite. So they're basically trying to um, get more people involved, get the UN's involved in international standard. Uh, I think Hong Kong government still looks up to the, well, still, uh, to um, the uh, standards, and they kind of still want to keep up that name. How much longer do they want to do that, I don't know with the current administration. Um, but uh, I mean, obviously, changing, uh, finding ways, changing um, um, social mentality 
is also important because you cannot just have a law without the, the change of the, the society. Um, so finding ways to change people's mind and taking part. Um, um, and all, well, we all, again, as I said, one of the work we do is for like, you know, engaging with uh, the government, um, engaging with legislators. So uh, you know, as, as, you know, we try to be on a like, own uh, approach. So, um, and since we're on that, we're always in need of volunteers. Great minds and people's students are uh, always a good find. So if anybody feels like helping, there's always a space for us to do some help. Great. So if you look at uh, different states, if you, uh, if you look at different states in, in, in this, this world, um, you could argue that um, the, uh, the way uh, minorities are treated, so for example, um, religious minorities, women's rights and uh, LGBT rights are a kind of um, cannery in the mine. So if the, if the cannery in the mine has no oxygen, it will fall down um, in relation to liberties in society. So if the LGBT rights are bad in the country, if the women's rights are bad in the country, if religious minorities are treated bad, then the liberties in the whole, for, for also for the majority, is going down the drain. Do you uh, agree with this? And what is your comment on this? Do you see that if you look to other states, mm -hmm. other countries? Um, I was uh, listening to, I, I forgot where I was listening to, uh, to the, uh, but I heard this the other day. It was basically talking about the uh, British Army, you know, the, uh, uh, the British Army um, obviously has not, for the longest time, uh, was very similar, I suppose. How similar? Well, was very similar to the U.S. way of dealing with uh, gay personnel. And you probably have heard of the last one child policy that the U.S. had until such recently time that they they decided to repeal that. The U.K. sort of like, you know, introduced the Equality Act. I think was it at the uh, sharing that we were at. Was it the Magna Carta? Or? I forgot where I heard this the other day, but there was the, the, the speaker was basically saying, well, like, you know, um, the British Army at the moment really thrives with attracting minds who could think differently. When you are suppressing that person, when you are trying to suppress, uh, um, you know, uh, and respect the diversity that we have as a people, um, you are limiting what, how best um, this entity can perform um, by drawing different, by, by drawing people with different minds together. You can make use of these ideas and actually sort of like, you know, uh, uh, emphasize uh, how the enemy thinks. And so uh, the article, I think it was whatever, and I was, it was a speaker, an article that I was reading or, or, or listening to, was really saying how that has really changed the British Army uh, and making it sort of like um, a place where everybody could come and really for it to thrive, to really have everything represented. Um, so I think that really means a lot um, in, uh, in the context of Hong Kong, um, where we very much stress on conforming, yeah. conformity, uh, and not sort of like, you know, not rock the boat, and I think that uh, and not be different. I think that really sort of has to change somewhere. And like, you know, um, rocking the boat is fine and it's not going to sink. Well, there's still room for improvement here. Absolutely. I um, think there's always improvement, yes. Um, yeah, if um, push so going forward, how do you feel about um, the chance of Hong Kong legalizing same-sex marriage? And I think also in particular, perhaps, how would you compare you know, this possibility and this case? victory for this, but then, you know, how do you see the future of gay rights? Yeah, the, yeah, okay, so the question was, <clears throat> am I optimistic seeing same-sex marriage being uh, became legalized in Hong Kong, and how... And I think it would be interesting for us to sort of see how you think, you know, 
how you compare these two cases. I mean, this possibility yeah. um, of legalizing um, same-sex marriage and then um, this particular yeah. case. Um, there were already some steps made, right, for cohabitation and uh, partnership certificates. Let's uh, go. No, as far no, there's no partnership uh, certificate. Indeed, uh, same-sex partners are the, 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 the uh, rights of same-sex partners <coughs> are not recognized okay. almost in any laws, except uh, recently there was the electronic health bill, uh, where um, um, since it, the government doesn't recognize doesn't want to recognize same-sex couples uh, and the existence of same-sex couples. It, basically says, well, anybody living in the same household would have access to the other person's uh, health uh, records uh, and, and the medical setting. Uh, so that way, sort of like, um, I mean, in, in, in how it's structured doesn't really recognize same-sex couples, but in practice it does because, like, you know, you have same-sex couples who live together, and oftentimes when one falls sick, when one falls sick, then the other person cannot get access to the treatment plans or related information. So that's one piece of legislation that sort of gives a de facto recognition to that. And the other one is the domestic violence ordinance, um, which recognizes uh, which recognizes uh, 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 married cohabiting couples in that kind of terms. But otherwise, there's little recognition um, uh, uh, in terms of. Uh, Same-sex marriage, I, unfortunately, with the current setup of our government, is, uh, I don't think um, it will be coming anytime soon. Uh, change will again probably be brought through litigation um, and judicial reviews. And, uh, and I think there are already uh, some attempts to uh, 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 inviting the court's opinions on this matter, for example, um, you probably have uh, heard or read about the case of UT, where it's where an English lesbian couple and one partner came to Hong Kong to work and the other partner cannot come to join her as a spouse. I mean, this will be almost automatic if you're a heterosexual couple. So the couple, the lesbian couple here is uh, 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 has filed a judicial review uh, to the court, and the judgment should be coming out in a few weeks. So, like already, there are already some small steps uh, inviting the court to look at the issue of whether it is right to exclude people um, who are legally married elsewhere. Um, I understand there should be other cases coming up soon, but that will be to come. Okay. Question from previous groups. Um, did you uh, learn about uh, statistics of uh, people who were offenders, criminals of uh, these uh, provisions we discussed before, 180 uh, once when they were under 60, uh, under uh, 21? So was this a real problem in the statistical sense? Or and what time frame? Uh, whether so, basically, the question is whether I knew of any statistics of people incriminated. Yeah. Under the charges that I challenged. Did people actually go to jail for this? Um, in Hong I understand there have been people charged and put in prison because of that, and I think, as a matter of fact, uh, on a slightly different case. Uh, and how many? I don't have the figures with me. Uh, I think those figures could be obtained from the, uh, probably from the Justice Department. I think I have I have uh, some data in my um, in my uh, files. Uh, I don't remember that uh, in my head. But I think uh, there had been cases, obviously, with people being put in bars because of the provisions that I challenged. Um, for for years or for for months. Or um, I I don't again I don't have okay. those figures here. Uh, you can research. Yeah, we, yeah. So, uh, but I think it was when uh, my case was happening there was two guys who were prosecuted for slightly different reasons. Uh, obviously, age uh, the age of consent was one thing, but then they were basically caught having sex in the car in the public. So um, they were 
their case touched on slightly different issues, but then their case happened around the same time when my case came around. So their case went on pending to the judgment of my case before they could proceed forward in terms of the Asian consent law. So um, definitely there are people who were affected by that. All right. Questions? Yeah. Um, do you think EOC has done enough for the LGBT rights? And if not, and what, what aspects do you think they can do with the government and also with the public to promote LGBT rights? Um, what can the EOC do? Yeah. And do I think the EOC is doing has enough? Done, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the EOC has been. Um, well, the EOC has been very supportive, uh, especially in the last few years, both with the previous um, uh, chairperson of uh, WC Land as well as the current Dr. Yong Shaw. Um, I trust that they would like to do more. I would hope that they could do more, but I also understand their limitations. I mean, you know, with the uh, uh, when they're refusing funding that they get from the government, and then like, there's that regulatory body that relies quite heavily on the government funding. So, yeah. allow the EOC you know, uh, also tell its equal opportunity organizations. Oh, the EOC is an equal opportunity equal equal opportunity commission. Um, so it's uh, it's a very watered down uh, uh, commission. Well, it's a very watered down. You know, uh, thing to uh, human rights uh, uh, commission that's required has been asked many times by the treaties. So um, uh, they have very limited mandate. Their mandate is very much limited on um, the four, uh, the existing discrimination laws. So the four pieces of uh, anti-discrimination legislation. So they can really say, well, it's not really our mandate to take to handle uh, uh, LGBT issues. But I think they are um, maybe great in for, like pushing the agenda as well uh, with the resources, um, with the limited resources they have, um, and uh, with the limitations imposed by different factors. So I think uh, obviously I would like to see I would like them to be doing more, but uh, I also understand the limitations. And, but then really like you know the government should be the one taking forward um, the initiative. Um, because the government and the, the, the setup of our government, uh, the administration or second executive has the power to do that, but yet it sits on the power and it does not do it. So. If you um, is your organization or the scope of your organization uh, does it include uh, China, People's Republic of China? Uh, is that mainland? Uh, yeah, well, if we don't, uh, we have some liaisons, and I, uh, some of my colleagues have exchanges uh, with uh, some of our Chinese counterparts. Uh, but otherwise, we don't work uh, on Chinese issues. If you can sketch the last 10 years, because now you're, uh, you have been following very, very close up, of course. Um, what is the trends? What, what are some of the trends you see? Um, maybe also to China, because you probably have good connections to China. So if you compare Hong Kong and China, what are the most uh, important trends in the field of emancipation of LGBT rights? Um, well, um, I don't know a great deal about the uh, situation in China, so I would try to um, I will not try to be an expert on that, uh, in, in that issue, uh, as much as I'd like to know more about it. But the impression that I got from the exchanges other people uh, have been on to is that um, they are having quite a vibrant community. Um, it seems that the difficulties um, that they have with uh, the gays, uh, particularly as opposed to gays, uh, is that the pressure is really coming from the family, uh, like, you know, um, reproducing the offspring part, like, you know, like, like, like you know, like, continuing your lineage. Um, and that was really, like, you know, the pressure uh, 
um, that I understand uh, the situation they have over in China uh, in terms of LGBT issues. Uh, it's not so much that socially, my understanding is that it's, it's, uh, my impression is that it seems to be a little bit more open. Uh, they don't have as much of the conservative religious force uh, fighting against them. So it's really that uh, uh, continuing lineage part that really affects them. Whereas here, but like. It affects also the state, of course. If you don't have uh, babies, you know, they have to use the same pressure for you. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, well, like, yeah. So, like, you know, you, you 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 might have read about, like, you know, like, you know, even straight people would hire a partner during the spring festival um, to go home and sort of like you know, deal with the pressure a little bit, like, you know. Um, so obviously, the gays uh, have the same situ uh, similar uh, situation that they're facing, and this is what I understand. But I'm trying not to be an expert on that because I really am not. Uh, the the and contrast that with Hong Kong. I think Hong Kong. Um, you know, um, we are more used to sort of like, you know, even straight couples, like getting married a little later and couples getting married, not having any kids anymore these days, I and mean, we have very low birth rate. Um, and I think against that backdrop, Hong Kong, um, the, the LGBT or, or the gays particularly, um, uh, have a lesser issue with sort of, like, you know, with being pressured to get married. Uh, but it's more for like in terms of um, realizing LGBT rights, it's more for like a conservative force um, that is there um, opposing what we're trying to do. Question from the audience? Um, does it bother you that the law, the legislature, only changed after eight years after ratification? So do you see, do you see it a win? Do you see it's a win only when the law changes? Um, I think, yes, it was frustrating. Like, you know, the government been sitting on it for eight years saying, well, it's a very difficult change that we need a lot of study into it. Uh, you know. Well, in the end, what happened? They crossed out 21 and they put 16 next to it. So, uh, I mean, like, something that a two year old can do, and I don't understand why the government took so long to do that. Um, it's frustrating, but I think, like, you know, the win really comes from the time when, you know, the judgment came out because obviously that became part of our law. Unfortunately, what it meant during that time was that a lot of people who were confused when they look up to the law. <laughs> which still said 21, uh, and I have personal friends who kind of come ask me, like, you know, like, what does that mean? Like, you know, 21, that red is 21. So that created a lot of confusion. Um, and, I mean, that is a bad example of having, uh, you know, how the law should be uh, accessible to people. And I think, like, you know, unfortunately, the government fell on that. Um, in the US, there is a movie uh, called I Am Michael, Michael Gladstone. Have you heard about this movie? No, I'm afraid not. Okay, well, that's one of the questions. I also did not see the movie yet. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, one, one of the things uh, is, uh, well, I, what I know about this movie is that the person, he started uh, a gay rights organization in the US, yeah. very famous. But then later he, um, he, he thought that he is no longer gay. So uh, yeah, that's very interesting. I would, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would like to know more. Uh, I, I wonder, like, you know, his journey to. I mean, I don't know his journey, so I don't know, but, like, you know. Um, do you come across this argument that, uh, that uh, homosexuality is uh, like uh, curable or that it's, that it's not just like who you are and you are born this way, like Lady Gaga sings so uh, eloquently? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I mean, like, you know, uh, to me, I, I never really uh, anchor my argument on whether homosexual, homosexuality was... Uh, you know, it's something you're born with, it's something you, you, you it's, it's, uh, 
short you require a choice. Put it says, like put in so many people says. Uh, and I think to me, if you're born with it, then you're born with it. And even if it's a choice, why does that choice make it so difficult for some people to swallow? Like, you know, why can people not respect that choice? Um, I think it's, I, well, it's, it's not fair to say it's pointless to argue either way, because obviously they have their own merits. But for me, my question is, like, you know, even if that person chooses one way or another, and I don't like that argument particularly, um, why do you have so much problems to accept that? Like, you know, what is your issue? I totally agree. Um, if you are hetero, you should be happy that there are more homosexuals, less competition, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And so we have the same problem, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, any more questions of the audience? Um, really, you can ask any question. Um, I'll see if I can answer that. Okay, one, one question from the previous group. Um, what, is your, uh, what, what is your response uh, and what do you think is the relation between LGBT and uh, democracy? Very broad question. Wow. Yeah. Uh, what is the relationship between LGBT and democracy? I think. Uh, to realize um, a society to be a democracy, to be a democratic society, um, you need to be able to take into account, obviously, the majority consensus, but at the same time, there needs to be the respect of the minority. Um, the respect of the diversity of you know people are different and they cannot simply be a majority rule um, that they say well because the majority will not leave like, you know we will never be a majority the gays will never be a majority so there will never be a majority voice for only coming from the gays um, the same way like you know there will never be a majority of people with disability or reduced mobility um, so there needs it cannot be an argument to say, well, like, you know, the majority have decided you don't have that right. This isn't right. I mean, it's the same way, like, you know, you don't put the right to a referendum. And this is what I find very interesting, like, you know, what is happening in the U.S. with, you know, proposition and whatnot. You cannot put a right to a referendum because, like, you know, how can you ask a majority to vote on a certain right off a minority? That doesn't make any sense to me. So I think, like, you know, to, to answer that question, it's like you know, there needs to be mechanisms and understanding that, like, you know, the rights of minority must be protected. Yeah. A follow-up question on that is uh, about the umbrella movement. Uh, do you see any change since that umbrella movement? Um, umbrella revolution. Sure. I. I think people participated in the umbrella movement for many reasons. Um, I was very happy to see that the element of diversity and inclusiveness was included um, in so many different uh, uh, pockets of the Tarkbot world that I went to. Uh, whether there was any change, um, I just don't really think there has been a lot of change from the policy level uh, on LGBT issues. Um, I think it has been um, encouraging, however, that the LGBT issues has been discussed quite um, vividly uh, in our media, in our classrooms, amongst our friends. Um, we were benefiting from the sort of like uh, the uh, same-sex marriage. Happenings all across the world, and in, in Taiwan, even it's like an election issue. Uh, and so I think I know all of that are changing people's mind. Uh, people get to read more about it. People get to uh, uh, learn more about it. But at the same time, I think change is also very important coming from an interpersonal uh, perspective. 
that you know um, you don't only just read about it, you don't only just um, you know uh, find out things from the internet, but there needs to be this dialogue uh, that needs to be had with people. I mean, I give you an example. Um, uh, I'm obviously a very out person, in case you haven't noticed. Um, <laughs> My mom knows I'm gay. Oh, well, okay, that's sort of silly. Well, my mom obviously knows I'm gay. Uh, She's been interviewed on TV and newspapers for her journey to acceptance. Um, she was uh, sort of like, you know, uh, very devastated when she found out. But it's been sort of like this eight years journey, nine years journey that I know she's like, you know, she is happy to be interviewed on TV being the, you know, uh, mom of the gay son. So my grandmother, she was like, you know, she's going to pride and tomorrow we're the fourth time that she doesn't uh, get too tired. I mean, she's 84. Um, my dad also passed away uh, a few weeks ago at the funeral. I shared, so you thank you. <laughs> uh, so while at the funeral I shared, uh, I shared, um, I gave a speech, and I, my dad and I weren't very close in that, like, you know, Asian families, you don't really get beat down personal with feelings and experience and all that. And I think uh, with my dad, our way of how we communicated, um, we weren't very close, so we didn't talk a lot. But he never um, said, well, you shouldn't do something, or you should really do something. Like, you know, should you? He, would, he, would be, he would be very much like, you know, okay, well, if you want to do it, you want to do it. Just watch out for yourself. And, like, you know, he, it was very, he never sort of like, you know, you shouldn't really do that. So when I took on my case, he um, um, obviously knew before it happened. I came out to mom, mom told him, and dad one day said, well, we have to talk. I'm like, well, what do we have to talk about? We have to talk. I know why you want to talk, but <laughs> what are we going to talk about? Um, and that, well, I call that my coming out experience to him. I didn't know how he would react. I didn't know how he would take on the message of me um, coming out publicly, taking on the JR. I really didn't know what to expect. Well, what he said was, well, if you thought clearly about this, um, if you know where you're going, uh, you'd be very public, you'd be very open, um, and uh, you might have uh, challenges in the future. Like you might have trouble finding a job, you might have problems with friends, you know, all these different things. And so he came from a very cautionary uh, side of, uh, you know, be careful what you're doing, but he never stopped me. And not once in this uh, conversation he, did he suggest, oh, you shouldn't do that. And that, to me, became a very profound uh, moment in shaping who I am. And that was sort of like a discussion that really left a very deep print in me. And, um, and I felt that I need to share that, because uh, um, it was not just my coming out experience. It was also like, you know, his way of, he is a very, like, you know, um, he doesn't really change himself for anybody. He doesn't, but you know, why should I change myself for anybody? But he just leaves them. Um, so I think like you know that was sort of like how I started with how I kind of came around like you know how, where I got my um, attitude in life. So I share that. But the whole long story aside, my aunt thought it was very inappropriate that I shared um, my coming out stories with my dad at the funeral in my speech. Um, I don't know why that was an issue because again like, you know I'm very open. It's not like nobody didn't know. Um, but she felt that was not the right place to talk about these things, certainly not in a church, I suppose. I don't know, it was a beautiful church, though. Um, and I engaged her in the conversation that I wouldn't let go at the dinner. I was like, well, why, why is it that matters to you so much that, like, you know, she was like, well, you have, you, I'm sure you have many experiences with your dad, like, you have to choose that one single incident. I'm like, but that was one incident where it left most profound touching me. So why can't I share that? And why should I, you know, change my story? Um, and uh, we talked about my exes. Um, well, two. There are not that many. Uh, <laughs> uh, when I said plural, it sounds like there are many. But um, <laughs> um, 
like, you know, well, when you brought your ex over, like, you know, we accepted him. You just didn't have to refer to him as your boyfriend. I'm like, well, I'm sorry, wait. So when I bring, when I talk about my ex and my boyfriend, I should have referred to him as my boyfriend. Would you refer to your husband as a friend to other parents? Um, and I think that really put a thought in her head and really put perspective in what she was saying, like, you know, um, that you should just, you know, you should sort of drop any reference that leads to the uh, review of your sexual orientation and, uh, you know, uh, and, and I think that really put a little seed in her head and I hope that will grow. Um, I'm like, you know, now why don't you try next week and go back to the class with your kids, uh, parents group and whatnot. Introduce your husband as your friend. How do you like that? And like, you know, it's not when 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 Pride is happening tomorrow, uh, and and, and I'm, I'm saying like, you know, uh, to to celebrate Pride is not to say it's not just so well. It's not like I go to a presentation and the first thing I say is like, hey, I'm gay. <coughs> Uh, the same way I think, like you know, straight people who don't go around saying I'm straight, but the fact that you share about your moments with your partner who is a different sex already implies that it already implies your sexual orientation. Whereas the gays, uh, when we want to talk about our boyfriends or like you know the ladies want to talk about you know stuff that they do with their girlfriends, they have to drop any of those references that implies their sexual orientation that might offend somebody. Um, that really sort of like, you know, it's the essence of like, you know, the coming out, um, the, the whole essence of coming out, like, you know, it's not to say, it's not only to say, well, I'm gay, but like, you know, it's a whole, like, you know, when you have to hide every other aspect just so you will not leave a trace of your sexual orientation, I think that's um, the challenge. challenge, that's sort of like, you know, the challenge, and that's personal interconnection that we need to have and that, that we need to engage other and so like you know the whole story is behind that is sort of you know the change how we were going to create change and I think like you know that is that interpersonal um, dialogue with people that I think like you know, is important in bringing change. Do you have a lot of problems with religious groups? I know in 2013 had this big uh, rally mm. uh, and uh, actually focus on LGBT and focus on same-sex sex marriage to proactively uh, avoid it. Mm. Uh, what, what is your, uh, <coughs> is, is it a factor that you have to take into account or is it not really so? Um, I think the conservative people all the vocal people are a very small minority. They're a very small, yet very well-funded minority that makes a lot of noise and uh, that has a lot of connections with the government, uh, with a very dysfunctional setup of a government. Um, and, and they're very loud. That makes it difficult for the moderate, I don't really mind the gays, uh, religious people, to say anything otherwise. Um, and and I, I know, since I talked about the funeral and my exchange with my aunt, I can also, I suppose, it's easy for me to share also, like, you know, my aunt, sort of like, I suppose, she would be going to the church, and, like, you know, she probably, like, you know, uh, I don't know what information she gets from the church, but, like, you know, she felt that was a, not a good place and not a right appropriate place to talk about gays, um, gay issues. Um, but I think, like, you know, the, the mix of moderate people, like, you know, whenever church is included in the equation, then the gay has to be out. Um, and, but then, no, I think, like, you know, the discussion needs to remain there. Um, I mean, like, you know, the discussion with people of different religion, religion, um, you know, that still needs to take place. We still have to talk about it. We cannot avoid talking about it just because, um, you know, I, I might offend people. And I'm, I'm saying this, like, you know, obviously I'm saying, you know, um, I'm not saying, well, I'm just, I'm, excuse me, 
I'm not obviously saying like, you know, I should just go and just wave my flag at the church, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm saying like, you know, rational, constructive dialogue with somebody and, and try to change the mind of people, like, you know, tell me why you think me being gay was so bad that it should not be mentioned at all. Um, so I think reasonable people think, uh, I'm confident and optimistic that reasonable people think, um, and if we can have a reasonable dialogue, um, and I hope like, you know, there are many of these seeds that could be planted. Um, um, and also, like, you know, <coughs> this is when the ally part really comes, like, you know, the friends of, you know, the straight friends here. Um, because, like, you know, again, the minority alone cannot change things. It relies really the majority people. And it relies the allies and everybody to be speaking on the topic. And, like, you know, when you're engaged, when the topic comes up, like, you know, find a way to engage yourself in the discussion and find out what is wrong or why the person feels it's wrong about that and just be very, like, you know, uh, reasonable. Um, and the discussion on the issue, so I think like, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, last few questions. Just a few more questions from the audience, maybe? Yes? Uh, not from the audience. <laughs> I was like, whoops, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, when you won, 
How did you celebrate? <laughs> <laughs> I think that I wish it was more juicy. Uh, <laughs> uh, after after the case, after winning the case, I think I spent the entire week doing interviews. Uh, <laughs> it was just like work, interviews, work, interviews, work, interviews, and work. So uh, we had we had champagne and also like you know, a little while later and. Uh, so, we didn't really have a, I mean, like, you know, we didn't really have a party, but until this was like, you know, an occasion where I got together with my friends, like, you know, we would kind of crack open a bottle of champagne, but it was not like, you know, we threw a party and whatnot, but uh, so it was like, you know, uh, yeah, again, like, you know, um, I wish it was sexier, but I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question about uh, Confucianism. Um, do you think there is anything inherently uh, incompatible with uh, LGBT and Confucianism? Um, I'm not very well versed, and I have, to, I have, and that's a great question. Uh, I have to apologize and say, well, I'm not very well versed with religion and Confucianism. Uh, so I mean, um, so I cannot really contribute to that. Um, you know, I come from a perspective of like, you know, I mean, even though my mom became more religious recently, my granny been um, associating with the church a little bit more, um, but it's not like, you know, we were very like, um, church everything, 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 like, everything Jesus. Um, I have never been affiliated with any um, religion, so um, from, I think like, you know, I'm um, sort of like, you know, I just sort of see myself as a more humanist uh, um, than anything else. So, like, you know, right. a matter of love and respect and, you know, treating others the way they want to be treated um, are values that I hold dear to. Um, and I think, I believe, and I like to think that, like, you know, the essence of that is embedded in other religion as well. Um, so, I hope. Uh, be it a philosophy or religion, like, you know, I think, like, you know, uh, loving and respecting other people's, um, and see that as the way you would, and really support what I think. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, last question of the audience, then after that I, I have the privilege to ask uh, one more question. So, first the audience. Ready, no more questions? How about any, anything from that side? Yeah. Have some questions over here. Don't be shy. Anything sexy and juicy you want to ask? <laughs> <laughs> Even though like, you know, I gave a boring answer, so I'm sorry. Um, okay, then I'll... I'll uh, yeah, okay. One more question. Do you think people generally want to get married? Yeah, I think that's a great. Well, yeah, I think that's a great question. Do all gay people want to marry? I suppose it's the same question. Do all straight people want to marry? Uh, I don't think all straight people want to get married. Uh, I personally don't really see myself getting married um, just yet. I suppose. Um, but the but if people want to make that set choice, they should have the means to. They should have a way to. Um, I mean, like, you know, uh, and I'm sorry to offend anyone who's married here, but at the same time, if people want to make that choice. Uh, they want to get into the institution if they're a couple. Um, great, like, you know, uh, and I respect that. But then, in terms of same sex, and we talk about that in the general sense, like, you know, like straight or gay. But the problem is that, like, you know, uh, now only certain members, only if you belong to a majority, do you have access to that institution? Um, and I think there is a problem there. Uh, it sends a message that, well, as gays, or if you don't fit in the majority, um, you will not enjoy these rights and benefits, um, uh, rights and responsibility uh, that we have as a society. You'll be marginalized and outcast, and I think that's the problem with that. Um, um, last question uh, I will ask uh, for, for today. Um, if you 
would have to give advice to our GAD students about um, if they were thinking of changing the law, starting a judicial review, what kind of advice would you give them? I don't give advice, I give very bad advice, so <laughs> I try not to do that. Uh, but if our JD students here wants to launch judicial review? Yeah, if they are uh, not happy with a kind of law, it doesn't have to be LGBT, it can also be other <laughs> topics. What would you uh, say to them? Um, don't even get started, <laughs> or... Yes. Uh, I think this really goes down to um, what I believe in. Have conviction in what you do. Uh, if you decide on doing something, um, do it. I mean, do it with conviction. Uh, I mean, one way or another. I mean, if you if you have to be a um, conservative fundamentalist uh, who goes against gay rights. Um, find your reasons, find your argue points, find good reasons to argue with me, and I respect that a lot more than, uh, well, I hear so-and-so said this is not very good and I don't think you should be gay, um, then I have a problem with that. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's following, I mean, yeah, I mean, JR is very important, uh, and, and, and find what you believe in and have conviction in what you're doing. So, um, thank you very much and I want to thank you for um, making Hong Kong a little bit uh, more equal and more uh, fair. Uh, on behalf of uh, the James students, thank you very much. For <laughs> Am I dismissed? <laughs> <laughs> So I hope to see you guys at Pride tomorrow. <laughs>